Excellent. Excellent. So my name's Charlie Hull. Um, I'm from Open Source Connections, where they search relevance people. Uh, some of you may have heard of us. And one of the great things about a conference like Berlin Buzzword is, is you get to bring together a bunch of people who are expert in their area, and you get to have some amazing conversations, conversations you won't, wouldn't have anywhere else, I think. So I'm very pleased today to be able to host uh, a, uh, a panel, panel discussion we've called the Great Search Engine Debate. And I'm very pleased to have five expert search people with me. Um, and we're going to have an open discussion about which search engine should you use. Now, the funny thing is that's a bit of a ridiculous question. Um, as a search consultant, the answer is always, it depends. It depends on your context, it depends on technology you already have, it depends on what you're trying to do. But we're going to explore the question and try and make, maybe make it a little less ridiculous and also have a bit of fun. It is the last talk of the day after all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all our panelists here to introduce themselves and give a very quick couple of minutes pitch on why the technology they represent is a good choice. I will say we don't have people here from every single possible search engine. Uh, that maybe would take a little longer, but we do have a, a pretty good set of people, uh, panelists here. So in, in advance, thank you all for participating. Uh, we'll keep it friendly, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Everyone up for that? So let's start on my left. So would you like to introduce yourself and what you represent? Is this on? Okay, great. So my name is Joe Christian Bergham, uh, and I represent Vespa, and I'm in the Vespa corner here. So yeah, so Vespa is a um, serving platform for search and recommendation. It's been in development and used in production since about 2004, so it goes back uh, a very long time. It was a Yahoo technology developed in-house in Yahoo, and then we open sourced it using our Apache 2 license in 2017, and after that, um, you also learn more about Vespa and the use cases of Vespa. And uh, why should you use Vespa? Well, we focus on ranking, both in the context of search, but also in the context of recommendations. And uh, so that's one of the key uh, features of Vespa is that we really focus on ranking. And we integrate with a lot of different libraries for doing ranking and also multi-phase ranking. And retrieval, you have different retrieval functions in Vespa. Uh, for example, vector search, also multi-vector search. Um, and you have the basics like BM25, keyword search, prefix search, all the classical features are in there that you expect from a search engine, but also with pretty good uh, functionality for doing vector search. So that's a quick intro to, to Vespa. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Charlie. My name is Alessandro Benedetti. I am CIS director. I work for this company. We are specialists in open source search engines. And I'm here as a representative of Apache Solar from the Apache Software Foundation. I am a Lucene and Solar Committer and Solar PMC member. So Solar is a search engine built on top of Apache Lucene. And it's been there for a while, actually, as well. As maybe not as long as Vespa, but is has been a few years. And why should you use uh, Apache Solar nowadays? So it's feature rich, scalable, uh, has been there for a long time. The community is still uh, holding strong. There are a lot of contributions. There are big companies behind, but it's fully open source. So it's by the Apache Software Foundation, which is a no-profit organization. So if you are focused on pure open source without a legacy behind like companies, Apache Solar can be like a good option. Uh, it offers support for many different features from lexical traditional search to vector-based search and integration with artificial intelligence techniques. And in general, it's quite stable, fast, and feature-rich. So I think it's a good idea to adopt it. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you. My name is Etienne. I represent VV8, and some of you may think that we actually produce coffee, but that's just our, our side project. <laughs> but I hope you had a great coffee uh, at, our, at our coffee stand. Uh, VV8 is a vector search engine, so those two 
probably started out with sort of more traditional search and moved into vector space. For VV8, it's a bit the other way around. We're sort of, we're calling ourselves AI native, which you can either see that as a buzzword or you can see that as like where our focus is on and what we prioritize, because in engineering is always trade-offs. And one thing that makes VV8 super cool, besides our awesome community, that's, that's another thing, but one thing is VV8 makes it very, very easy for you to get started. If you want to integrate like with an existing model provider, for example, so OpenAI, Cohere, et cetera, you can do that with like two lines of code and, and basically get started very quickly. So you don't need to have any kind of AI background, but still have the ability to get started quickly. But at the same time, it's not just about sort of simplifying this because running search and production is difficult and all of us, I think, can agree on that. Um, but vv has got you covered along the way. So while it's easy to get started, you can still take it to production, scale it for your workloads, have like your latency requirement that you need in production, et cetera, and we've got you covered all the way. Stay out of the mic. So let's start on this side. Yep, this is Ozoan. Cool. Hi, I'm Philip. I work for Elastic. I don't think I need to introduce Elasticsearch. So our pitch is we're still the same old, or maybe not old, but the same Elasticsearch um, that we've always been and always been doing. And nowadays, we've added a lot of new cap capabilities around vector search, dense vectors, KNN search, um, bringing your hugging face models to run within the Elastic Stack to run the inference there. So all of the, the things that everybody has been building on for a long time, uh, plus a lot of the, the new hotness uh, from Langchain integration um, to whatever else you want to do around uh, AI and all the other buzzwords. They're there on top of what we have been doing for the past before. Thank you, Philip. Uh, hi, my name is Katzper and I represent Quadrant. Quadrant is an open source vector database, uh, AKA uh, vector search engine or similarity search. But no matter how we call that, it's all about uh, the embeddings. Uh, we chosen a minimalist approach, so we are solely focusing on uh, vector search and we are we just aim to make it as fast as possible uh, that is like the uh, main rule that we try to to, to keep on going uh, we are basically uh, offering a tool that allows you to perform a vector search as long as you can provide your own vectors we strongly believe that you are able to uh, vectorize your data somehow and you already know how to deploy it to production uh, so we, what we offer is uh, uh, just a fast retrieval with some additional tweaks on top uh, and some additional filtering capabilities, not only a vector search, uh, but all with uh, keeping the best performance possible in mind. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So that's our, our five different search engines. So I'm going to start off with some other questions to help us explore this area of you know, maybe which ones you might want to use or explore. So um, the first thing I'm going to ask is, what's your search engine's approach to scaling? How big can you go? And I'm going to firstly, I'm going to give that to Etienne. OK, cool. So scale is actually something, I think, if we're looking back to last year, scale, we defined this as what is the maximum sort of possible data set size that you could run in VV8. And for us, I think a, a sort of psychologically important number that now in hindsight almost feels kind of embarrassing to say that, but at some point that was a very, really big number. We wanted to get to like 1 billion vector embeddings and that felt significant at the time. But recently what we've seen is that there are very few companies who have billion data points that just need to be added to a single index. So something that we're seeing a lot lately is that people have maybe tens of billions of vectors but they're somehow grouped for individual tenants. So something that VV8 also focuses on is not just the number of objects, but the number of tenants that you can run that each have their own separate vector spaces and like compliant deletes, et cetera, and these kind of things. And for scaling, uh, one of the, the abilities there is just pure horizontal scaling. Like if you ever run out of space, you just add nodes to your cluster and you can schedule your, your uh, new tenants basically on new nodes, um, which, is something that, that works really well with that sort of isolated approach of, of, um, yeah, of having uh, multiple tenants. And uh, that also allows for 
and I don't know how much time you have, probably not that much <laughs> to, to go uh, like very deep, but that allows for, for very cool things of having some tenants that are maybe not active at the same time. So one question that we always ask is basically, should you pay for vector search just for the amount of objects that you currently have imported, or should you pay for what you're currently querying? So that sort of separation of storage and compute is a very big topic in, in VV8 right now, like parts of it are already in there, part of it is on the roadmap, and that I think for me, for scaling, is, is the most exciting topic about uh, vector search at the moment. Great. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, do you want to pass the mic on? Actually, I'm going to go to Joe. Joe. Yeah, so Vespa scales pretty well. We had a good talk here earlier today from, uh, from Quadrant, a French web search. Uh, they're using it in production with a 5 billion web index. So um, that's one scalability dimension. Um, and the other scalability dimension is throughput and latency. And uh, yeah, we handle that as well. So, so it just uh, works. It just works. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, we just put 48 billion vectors into a single Vespa um, cluster the other day, so or last week. So, uh, yeah, we can we can we can index a lot of data if we want to. Excellent. Thank you. So we've gone from 1 billion to 48 billion. Alessandro, what about solar? So uh, I would like to start in for solar scalability so in general, so not only talking about vector-based search. So scalability has been a centerpiece in solar features for a long time. And we approach scalability from, first of all, a domain perspective. So we allow users to separate their data in different collections, which end up being different indexes. And we implement the possibility of loading the index in the native memory of the operative system. So it's not only allocated in the memory of the process, of the Java process, of the solar Java process, but also externally. And based on like uh, memory mapping capabilities of the operative system that gives like possibility to scale it up quite consistently with good performance and also implement sharding, which means that you can split your data across different nodes, different solar nodes, that then can be coordinated in what is called solar cloud architecture that allow to scale it up and enrich like good amount of numbers in terms of documents. Uh, there are plenty of benchmarks around solar, like reaching billions numbers of documents. For vectors, uh, I, I have to admit we are quite new to the vector-based search race. And we, are, we have still to build like full detailed benchmark, but we're going to get there. So we have an initial benchmark with some uh, like hundreds of thousands of documents, but we would like to have more information available for users to understand how we can scale it up also from vector-based perspective. Fantastic, thank you. So, Casper, what about scale? Um, yeah, so basically you have lots of users that are using Quadrant on a daily basis with millions of vectors, but there are also some of them which are reaching billion scale uh, vector search. Um, this is actually one of the things that we were also experimenting with. This seems like to be a limit for all the vector databases. They're just trying to reach that, uh, the, the threshold of billions, uh, billions embeddings. And I'm not even talking about, uh, well, I love this project, actually. Somebody has uh, published that recently on Reader. Uh, they introduce uh, one-dimensional embeddings, so I'm not talking about this kind of experiments, but we are also able to, to put a billion uh, vectors into a single machine on the higher end, of course, but, but still that's the scale that uh, Quadrant can handle. And some of our users are already reaching that, uh, that, that numbers. Thank you. Philip. So Elasticsearch can do like three-digit number of nodes, terabytes of RAM, petabytes of disk. The question is just, do you want to really care about that? So in terms of scale, what we are mostly looking at right now is a serverless offering so that you basically get an endpoint, you throw data at it, and it does the rest like scaling up and down for you automatically. Um, splitting up the index tier and the search tier, um, backing all of this up by S3. That is for us, I think, a lot more exciting than just adding more nodes um, and making management of that harder, just to automate all of that away that you don't have to care about all of those details anymore. Fantastic. So that sounds great. Scale as far as you want by the sound of it, eventually. But I'm going to ask you maybe a, a slightly harder question now. Um, 
And I'm going to come to, I think I'm going to come to Etienne first. What applications don't suit your engine? Ooh, I, I love this one. And I have to admit, I didn't prepare for the question. I knew I could have, <laughs> but I just found out five minutes ago. Um, what doesn't scale, I, I love this because I, I think someone, and, and maybe that person is in the audience, I don't know, I wasn't there before, but someone asked us before about something that I would say would be a traditional use case uh, with sort of threat detection in a time series uh, a kind of kind of database mode. And I think some of the databases here, like I think for, for Elasticsearch, for example, that could be a prime use case. But for us, that's something that we, I don't want to say don't care about, but it's something that we haven't seen fit the, I would say, traditional vector search or recommendation kind of model. So not saying that you can't do time series in, in vectors, but for some things where, yeah, for some things, a columnar store, for example, might be better suited. So we're, we're trying to get use cases that make sense, but like not literally cover every single use case in the world, because I think then your, your project just gets diluted. That's a very specific answer for, for one uh, that just recently came to, like a couple of hours ago, came to us. So I that, that makes sense. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Alessandro? I would say Solar is not a database. So mostly I would answer, like, if you want to use Solar as a database, don't, don't do it. I mean, to a certain extent, you can consider it as like a NoSQL database, but it, it won't shine in that kind of usage in comparison to real NoSQL databases. And I'm saying this because I've seen people using it as a database. And yeah, it's, it's not been designed for doing that. So yeah, it's possible, but yeah, it, I wouldn't use it specifically for that. So yeah, that would be my summary. Joe. Yeah, don't use Vespa for log analytics. We are focusing on ranking, search, search boxes where people actually type something. Uh, we are not into logs and log analytics and searching your logs. That's not a Vespa use case. Thank you. Philip, what shouldn't you use Elasticsearch for? First, we're happy to take your logs. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I, I think being based in Lucene, um, and we're very happy and proud to be based in Lucene as well, um, very frequent updates are not a great use case for the immutable nature of how Lucene segments are formed. So if you have something that is updated five times a second, that is probably, or maybe you find a structure to, to kind of like have a different data structure that your documents are not updated that frequently, but something like that will be bad for Elasticsearch. Also, we're a really bad blob store, even though people keep trying. Um, <laughs> We are also like, if you want to stream a ton of data out of Elasticsearch, um, use something that is doing stream, streaming like Flink. Um, those are things that we keep seeing people trying, but they are not necessarily great use cases. Casper. Uh, yeah, so basically I would say, if you already have uh, some sort of search mechanism and you are pretty happy with, with the uh, precision it uh, provides you, then maybe extending with, with vector search is, is pointless. But um, this is quite a common example, but if you uh, want to provide search for a very specific audience, I don't know, like you are selling some specific car parts which have some sort of uh, identifiers that your, uh, your users will consistently use in order to search for some certain things, then vector search won't solve it at all. Definitely that's not the, not the use case. And from my practice, I also saw that some of our users wanted to use uh, Quadrant, because in Quadrant you can store vectors along with some JSON payloads. And they were trying to use uh, some sort of replacement for MongoDB, just trying to put some JSON documents without providing any, any embeddings next to them. So that's definitely not the proper use case, but that really depends. Wonderful. Well, that, I mean, I think that does prove the point that if you give a user a piece of software, they will try and do anything to it. <laughs> Sometimes crazy things. So, so obviously, we're all in the exciting new world of AI. And so our next question is going to be about how does your search engine support AI-powered applications? And obviously, here we've got some representatives from companies where they, that's where, how, where they started. And in some cases, we've got companies that maybe came to that a little later. So how does that balance out? I'm going to ask Joe first. You want me to go first a lot? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I think Vespa is really well positioned. Um, if we talk about machine learning for search, I don't really like the term AI. So, But if you go to blog Vespa AI, 
<laughs> you, you can check that we've been written, uh, writing about using transformer language models for ranking since 2020. Um, so we have a lot of features for that, uh, also for embedding models to actually embed them into Vespa so you can run the inference. We just also announced acceleration, acceleration uh, using GPU. I'm not sure if the other engines uh, support GPU, uh, maybe Vivid, I don't know. Um, so that's one thing, and also having this, to, to, to take this into production, like the quant case here with five billion documents, they have a multi-stage retrieval and ranking pipeline, and Vespa is really good at uh, representing that. So you have candidate retrievers, then you have ranking steps, and then you have multiple of those to trade latency uh, versus uh, accuracy, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry about the AI term, but I, I, I share a little of your, your um, approach there. You know, don't really like the term, but there comes a point where everyone's using it. You've kind of got to go along, go with the flow. So, yeah, and we chose Vespa AI in 2017. So, uh -huh. okay, okay. Uh, let's come to Philip. Sure. Um, so, I also have heard AI being overused a little bit the last few weeks. Um, so let's not go there. So I think we're where we see all of this coming in, like we, we also do inference from Hugging Fair, so wherever your models come from uh, within the stack. Um, I think a big part where we see that you have a lot of data that is either private or custom to your organization, for example, in Elasticsearch already, and you can then combine that in an interesting way, for example, with large language models or LangChain that we also support. So for example, if you have your users and they ask like, what is my insurance policy? The large language model will not know your company-specific uh, insurance policy, but it can use retrieval to retrieve your actual policy and then use the large language model to answer your question in the right context and abbreviate it. So we see retrieval as a big part of like what is like built with ChatGPT and AI stuff around it, um, but the retrieval of either personal information or very specific information will still be a big part in the future. And that's where we come in on top of all the other developments that are happening right now. Plus vector search and everything else playing into that, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alessandro. So I've been personally driving the initiative for bringing neural search to Apache Solar and neural slash vector based search. And we got it with the 9.0 release, uh, May 2022. Then we've been working supporting pre-filtering, so the ability of mixing up vector-based search with like lexical traditional filters to reduce the, amount, the scope effectively for your vector-based search. And that came uh, with 9.1. And the, the plan is now to support in 9.3 the possibility of adding vector-based search distances slash similarities as feature in learning to rank, which will bring like new possibilities of combining like vector similarity scores with traditional lexical similarity and other features, of course. We added the support for high dimensional vectors that is going to come with 9.3, which is the next release. And, and also the, the possi possibility of having like uh, float vectors that, that uses effectively uh, a, a certain amount of memory and byte vector elements. So if you have like um, a requirement that's not so strict, so you don't have too many values to be represented in your vectors, you can basically like avoid to waste the additional memory necessary there. And we're going to work also integrating like uh, machine learning integration for highlighting and for summarization of top K results. So that's on the roadmap. Thank you. Casper. Yeah, so definitely vector search is all about using some machine learning models. So that's also a requirement if you want to start using Quadrant. So we do support that like natively. Uh, one of the use cases that we've seen uh, becoming more, more and more popular is to use it as uh, use vector database as a knowledge base to introduce some uh, context into the prompts uh, that are being sent to chat GPT like models. So that's definitely uh, also supporting AI uh, or machine learning based pipelines. 
But uh, yeah, we are also trying to, to make it more affordable. So if you have huge knowledge bases, then you can probably just uh, reduce the, the, the usage of memory. So we are working mostly on that, just to make the uh, it's not only uh, faster, but also more accessible by reducing the cost of usage that. Thank you. At the last. Yeah. yeah, so in the term AI, we have a big banner over there that has the word AI plastered over it. So I think we kind of like the term. And it is a buzzword, but that's also kind of the name of the conference, right? So that's a... And, and <laughs> <laughs> we, we had to bring one buzzword. <laughs> or we couldn't see the correlation to Berlin, so it's AI. Um, no, but we think like that the mere fact that you're in this audience here means you're so far ahead of the crowd about anything AI related. Like there's, there's such a large untapped, I don't want to say market, that's a business term, but such a large group of people that, that will have some kind of impact, like their life will be changed in one way or another, even if it's just sort of learning about chat GPT or these kind of things, um, that we really, really, really want to get people to get started with this and sort of make their first move with AI. And that in VB8, a lot of focus has gone into making that as accessible and as easy as possible so that you can integrate with whether it's OpenAI or Cohere or AWS Bedrock, Google Palm, um, uh, Azure OpenAI, of course, like all these kind of models that, that are out there and that you want to use, but you don't want to sort of necessarily start learning about that right away. You want to, or at least I'm personally, I'm the kind of person that learns by doing and experimenting with these kind of things. And that is something that VV8 allows you to, to do, to just integrate them. You don't have to, you can of course bring your own vectors, like why would we not support that? But also, if you want to get started, you can use these integrations. And they work for text to VEC, they work for image to VEC, for, for any kind of media to VEC. Um, also for generative AI. So for example, you can, you can use VV8 as the knowledge base for your large language model and then pass the context to the large language model and have the, the model uh, use that context to, to reduce the hallucination problem. So that is so much, yeah, so much AI and so much buzzword in there but for a good reason, because we think there's just so many applications and we really, like, even if the crowd in here thinks, yeah, AI is just a fancy term for ML, but if it helps us reach a larger audience together, sort of as, as the engine in that space, I think then it's kind of okay to use a buzzword every once in a while. <laughs> okay, thank you. I do love the idea of everyone bringing their own buzzword to Berlin Buzzwords. I think we should all do that next year. Bring a new buzzword. So, um, these are all open source engines represented here. And I think one of the most important things about open source is community. And I want to just ask the question, what's your approach to your community? And, and why do you think that's important? And I'll start with Casper. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're trying to, to help our community to build some amazing applications based on our, our tools. Uh, we are just uh, having a Discord community that is open for everyone. and we keep track on uh, some upcoming questions. But uh, we also love uh, not only the feedback, but also the contributions that we got uh, from the community. Uh, one thing that I appreciate probably the most was like an overview of all, of the, all the endpoints that we could expose done, done by somebody uh, from our community. Uh, but we also have some new colleagues uh, joining us just because they decided to contribute uh, it's an open source at the end of the day, so we try to, to uh, be responsive and help uh, people uh, building, uh, build cool things. And we try to uh, listen to them and uh, like include their feedback and their use cases as much as we can. Okay, so for, from one of the newest communities, let's go to probably the, uh, possibly the oldest communities. So, uh, Alessandro. So at Solar, we follow the Apache Software Foundation guidelines for the communities. So you have a PMC that is like an, a group of people that drive the project and curate the directions and any important matter related to the project. And then there is a set of committers that uh, contribute code. In general, we offer the possibility of communicating and raising bugs and new ideas and new features through uh, Jira. 
and so anyone can just contribute like a patch, a pull request on GitHub, so the code is accessible on GitHub and it's possible to, to contribute code that is going to be reviewed by the committers. We have a mailing list that is actively used to share both ideas from development perspective or a user perspective. And, and in general, uh, we are quite welcoming for both code, support, uh, we have a Slack channel as well for like uh, online quick chat kind of support. And it's been going on for a while and I think it's working decently well. So I'm quite, I'm quite happy to be honest of the current status of the solar community. <laughs> Fantastic. Joe, what, what's your approach to community? Yeah, I, I, I first disagree with your statement that all of these engines are open source. Uh, because Elasticsearch is, is not open source, right? It's not using an open source license. So it's source available, it, it's a better term. But yeah, in terms yeah, of fine. community, uh, Vespa is Apache 2 license, so you can fork it, do whatever you want to with it in that way. So that's good. Uh, but on contributions on the code side, uh, we do get contributions. Uh, for example, Spotify, they contributed um, a fussy query operator. They wanted to have like fussy search, they're using Vespa. Uh, and building community is also about uh, helping people using Vespa, and we have about 1,000 people in our Slack space, so we communicate, the developers communicate with uh, users. Uh, yeah, and, and, and also we try to educate users on our blog, where we write about how to take uh, these new methods into, um, into actual products, and, and also demonstrate the weaknesses of vector search uh, and what works and what doesn't work. We, we really try to guide people uh, on that. I think that's important to be honest about these new models and new technology that people are trying to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good point. To show what doesn't work, it, I think, is, is a very good educational thing. Um, Etienne. Yeah, so um, for us, I, I find it quite interesting that in, I think both of your definitions of community contributors played a role. Like, of course, we love our contributors, but I think if you would go by contributor account, VV8 would probably have one of the smallest communities. Um, but I think VV8 has one of the most active, most vibrant, largest communities that's in sort of users that help each other out. So for, for me, sort of building this up from, from scratch, there was a turning point where at some point on our public Slack, that a question was no longer answered by a staff member from VV8, but by someone on the community, and that that was the first time that happened. That was just crazy. It's like, okay, we're actually building something that's that's in a sense bigger than us, and this is exactly what what community is about for us. Jo Joe would probably say we have more dev roles than developers, which is not true, <laughs> um, but really this kind of focus on who are our users, how can we learn from them, how can we make their lives easier, and in turn, they make our lives easier because they help us find bugs, they help us find issues, they give us feedback on, on API design, they, they give us feedback on usage patterns, they tell us sort of, and yeah, what's coming up next, and this is worth so, so much. So it's like really hard to, to, to quantify, but I'm really happy about that. Great, thank you. So, Philip, what does community mean to Elastic? I think for us, community has always been a a scaling function, and I, I don't know how many numbers I should bring out now, but we have a sizable community. I think if we combine across channels, like we have 150 meter groups worldwide, we have about half a million people that have touched the Elasticsearch brand and technologies to some degree that we have tracked. Um, and these have made the product better in terms of feedback. I think that's an important function, but also in terms of helping each other out. So for us, we have more than 20,000 people on the community Slack. It's pretty common that the community answers the community because we just cannot keep up with those anymore. Um, so the community is really an important scaling function about that. I, by the way, have a talk tomorrow about, like, we have a contributor program to basically incentivize the community to contribute to us. We made a mistake to reward that with MacBooks, and we, then we got a lot of cheating because of that. And I'll show you tomorrow all the things that can go wrong if you set the wrong incentives and what we have learned along the way in terms of community. So I think from, from that point, we, the community is very important, but you also need to treat it the right way. Um, otherwise, things can go sideways easily. And I don't think I want to go into the license discussion right now. Um, I can, from our download stats, say that for 95% of the people, um, free and open is good enough. Maybe not if you're Amazon. 
I think this is possibly a conversation for later. Over there. <laughs> anyway, so here's a slightly more interesting question uh, about uh, which we're going to have to make a choice now. So I'm going to ask you all, if you were developing a search application and you, for some reason you couldn't choose your own engine, which of the other engine, either represented here or not, would you choose and why? So I'm going to start with Casper. Uh, okay, so functionally wise, if I would need to choose a different tool that would be somehow similar to, to Quadrant, I would probably choose Pinecone, but since it's not open source, and I'm a big fan of uh, openness in, in software development, I would probably go for some standard tools like Elasticsearch or OpenSearch. Since they uh, implemented vector search already, that's, that might be, uh, and are pretty familiar to, to most of the people working with search, that would be like the, the first choice. Mm. But yeah, I think that, that would be it probably, but, but uh, honestly I would need to check all the other tools because this is so uh, rapidly changing uh, area that maybe there is something different that I uh, do not know yet. Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, Alessandro. So, first of all, I don't have much experience with VEV8 and Quadrant, so no offense <laughs> if I'm not going with, with your solutions. So, uh, I've been for a long time also uh, a fan of, of Elasticsearch, of course, been using it. Uh, so, if I would have to recommend something that's not solar, for a long time I would have said Elasticsearch, but unfortunately, licensing. In, okay, we won't talk about it, but of course, it's a different situation right now. And also, probably, if I would go, go with something like different from Light Solar, Vespa is the, I would say, the most different because it's not using Lucene, it's using like different approaches, it's covering different kind of problems with from a different angle. So yeah, right now, if it was not Solar, I would probably go with Vespa. Thank you. Well, I'm now going to pass the mic. I think you should pass the mic to Joe. Joe, you don't have to say solar. <laughs> but you can if you like. Who made your last coffee? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a tough question. And uh, I mean, I have a lot of respect for the Apache Lucene uh, project, right? It's been going since 1998, I think, Doug Cutting uh, open sourced it around that Lucy, time, right? Yes. And you look at all the committers and all the efforts, and it's a really great search engine library, right? And it has a lot of features, functionality. So my preferred choice would be to build something on top of Apache Lucene. Right? And if I have to, then I have to use uh, Apache Solar. <laughs> If you have to. Let me expand a little bit on that. Solar is a little bit difficult to use, but I've been in this field for some time. Uh, we also configure stuff with XML <laughs> in Vespa and uh, Solar do as well, so I'll manage that pain. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'll get some help from Alessandro, I hope. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So, Etienne. Yeah, so I heard this question for the first time, but it wasn't the first to answer like five minutes ago, so I had, had some time to think. And I'm going to do the, the easy way out. I'll pick two choices. Uh, <laughs> is that cheating? Oh, no, no. It's, we'll let you off. It's cheating? Okay. Go on. Okay, I'll, uh, I would pick Vespa for the fact that Vespa, I think, does really well in combining both worlds. So you can do traditional search um, or keyword-based search like BM25 and dense vector search. In fact, that is, I think, something that Vespa released before BB8 supported that. Um, and that is, it, it's just used every day in VB8, and I really wouldn't want to miss that feature. So for that, I would put, uh, I would uh, choose Vespa. And uh, I think the other one that I would choose is actually Quadrant, because it's easy to get started, because it's more minimalist in what it does. So it's just, if you already have your embeddings, you can just get started, and that's, that's cool. I wouldn't, to be honest, know how to run either Solo or Elasticsearch, but that's more like me not being experienced with those tools. Okay. <laughs> next, next time, Philip. say VBA. <laughs> so, I'll pick something a bit more exotic, which I'm, I'm not sure. Has anybody heard of Orama Search? One? Okay, one person. Um, so, it's a bit of more an exotic choice. It's written in TypeScript, no dependencies. Um, it's different. It's not like Luna.js or something that you run in the browser. You can also run it in the browser, but it's a search engine that you can run on the edge, which 
I'm not sure that is the winning strategy going forward, but at least it's, a, it's an interesting approach to the search problem that if you have like a small to medium data set, that you start running that not in a central place anymore, but that you push it out to the edge to run your searches there, which gives you interesting attributes, especially around auto-completion. Um, and it's, it's very early. It has quite a few GitHub stars already, um, and I think they're implementing part of the engine under the hood in Rust nowadays as well, but otherwise it's just TypeScript, and it's very much for the front-end developers. But it's a bit of a different take on search just to bring in something else than what we've already discussed. Thank you. And I think the interesting thing there is, you know, I, I hadn't heard of that at all. Uh, we've got, again, we've got different reasons for making those choices. But the great thing about working in search, and I've done this for over 20 years, is pretty much, you'd think that somebody would write the perfect search engine, and we, we could all stop writing search engines. But no, a new one seems to appear every few months. And I think that's a great thing, because people are still innovating and you know, creating new wonderful things for us to try. And as search developers, that, you know, it's lots of fun trying out some new ways of doing search. So um, I'm going to ask all of you what's coming, what's, the, what's coming next? What's the major thing that's coming next? That you're, that, you know, you maybe give us a little view into the future with your engine um, and why it's exciting. OK, and Philip, I, you, I know you just talked, but I'm going to start again with you. Right. So I, I think there, is, there are two different answers I would give to that. Um, there is the, the very engineering-driven one. Um, that is, there is a lot of exciting stuff coming around Elasticsearch and Lucene. For example, Project Panama. Um, that is also giving a nice speed boost around vector search. Um, yes, Uwe, um, thank you. Um, and we'll, we'll keep working, or, or you and others will keep working on that and making Lucene better. So I think there is a lot of interesting engineering things happen. Also, in part because Java sometimes still has a bad reputation, but I think it has developed very well over the last few years and pushed everything based on Lucene quite far. Um, and then there's a the higher level perspective, I think, as a company. Um, I've already talked about serverless, which we find pretty exciting because it will just abstract a lot of problems away that people have been complaining for a long time. Um, the other thing that we'll also do soon is we'll add a new query language because we haven't had enough, um, <laughs> but one that will bring a proper query engine to Elasticsearch and then also be able to push down queries further to Lucene, which, and that also lets you combine what you would need to do in multiple steps right now and kind of like push it down to Lucene and retrieve that in one step. Um, that will give you a major performance benefit. So that is kind of on the more bigger picture strategic level, I think, what is relevant for us, plus the continuous improvements around um, vector search, Canon search. There have been quite a few low-level improvements there, but it would take too long to go through all of those. But there's a lot of stuff happening uh, to keep moving forward. Thank you. Joe, what do you think is the most exciting new thing to be coming in Vespa? Um, yeah, we just launched uh, all the GPU acceleration of uh, embedding models, which I think is uh, really important. And we saw a talk on the bar camp from Otto, where they said that it was quite easy to take an embedding model and represent it in Vespa, so they didn't have to have additional infrastructure for dealing with that. Um, and lowering the barrier, I think, is important for getting started, getting a minimal viable product out. So that's something that we are focusing on and making it a lot easier to uh, run embedding models inside Vespa. Um, we're also going to release a new vector search mode in Vespa very soon, um, uh, which will have better support for multi-tenancy uh, personal data, things like that. Uh, and that's the 48 billion use case I, I talked about earlier. Um, yeah, and generally making it easier to, to use. Uh, so that's, that's our focus uh, for Q3, I think. Yeah. And also we added dot product as a new distance metric in, in Vespa. We didn't support that, uh, but we now do. So and that's important for some of these models, especially in recommender system that doesn't use normalized vectors, but actually have a raw uh, dot product score. So we just added that uh, to complement. Yeah. Thank you. Casper. Uh, yes, so basically, um, our core team is right now experimenting with something that probably for shouldn't be relevant for search engineers at all, because for you that will be like a, just a, a different mechanism that you can enable, but don't really need to know the details. But actually, that comes uh, the suggestion comes from our community, uh, something that we uh, didn't predict. People were using some slow, uh, slower disks or slower network disks on cloud setup. So we are just experimenting with uh, different async APIs, some 
really low level stuff and I'm not going to uh, go deep into the details because I do not understand them to be honest. But that's basically something that will uh, hopefully speed up the, uh, the search, uh, search operation even on slower disk by 10 times. But also some smaller changes in, the, uh, in our API, we are going to ex uh, extend the, uh, the parameters which can be changed on an existing index, so you can simply, uh, you will be simply uh, able to experiment with different setups and find this uh, proper configuration to achieve the best performance possible, but, uh, possible, but also to keep the, the usage of memory as low as possible in the same time. Thank you. Alessandro, what's coming next in Solar? So, two main lines of work, consolidation and innovation. From consolidation perspective, we are, we've been working on an initiative to uh, redesign and consolidate the REST API endpoints and increase security in Solar. And in general, of course, additional bug fixing uh, for like consistent scalability and all the and also simplification of some of the possibilities in solar because it, solar is very feature rich but there are sometimes features doable in many different ways and that's complicated for users so we want to consolidate and simplify that as well from the innovation perspective we are continuing working with neural search integration so vector based search integration um, we are going to get the, the same benefits from Lucene as well. So as, as Elasticsearch is going to get like Panama speed ups, for example, uh, we are going to get that as well. And, and in general, we want to make it easier for users to uh, encode text to vectors and enrich their result list, for example, with highlighting snippets uh, using machine learning to generate to generate them, so to move away from like lexical highlighting, and in general to summarize uh, top K results using large language models, for example. And so this is coming soon, let's say. <laughs> cool. So on the VV8 side, the, the timeline uh, for, for this is very short term because I think our next release is out in two, two and a half or so weeks. And this is mainly focused on two things. One is, I hinted at this in the beginning already, uh, native support for multi-tenancy. So before with multi-tenancy, you kind of had to do like a workaround in VV8, which worked okay with maybe five to 10,000 tenants, but now our goal is really millions of tenants and most importantly, linear scalability of, of tenants. So if you run out of tenants, you just add more info and it, it can handle that. Uh, VV8 does that in a sort of compliance or in a, in a GDPR compliant way, so allows for easy dropping of tenants, allows for using cloud storage, for example, uh, for, for tenant to reduce your operating cost. And that is, I think that was recently one of the most frequented features of, of VV8. I'm super happy that we can deliver this, but that's just one of two. The other is uh, VV8 introduced PQ compression. So for anyone new to vector, that's basically the idea that you would uh, compress your vector space safe on memory and it's like always a bit of a trade-off um, and this was labeled as experimental and we did this on purpose not because we didn't trust our own solution but because we wanted to get early feedback in and still be able to tweak something which could potentially contain a breaking change and this experimentation phase is ending now which means it's really general uh, availability and what we did now, I think initially we, we focused a bit on like benchmark cases and benchmark data sets are a bit far from what people use in reality. But this time we put a lot of effort into sort of modeling what our users actually use. So for example, OpenAI has 1500 dimensional embeddings and uh, the kind of stuff that you can do with compression, where we're like 1500 dimensions means that there's lots of memory. So there's also lots of benefit of compressing. And uh, we're focused more on these real life cases and it's, it's pretty amazing what you can do there with compression and sort of not lose a lot of accuracy, not lose a lot of speed, but just cut the memory consumption way, way down. So that will make VV8 way cheaper to run for anyone that runs with like very high dimensional embeddings. I'm super excited about that. Thank you. So I think we're gonna to come to our final question now. So I'm gonna ask, uh, ask you all, What's the, your favorite um, implementation or application and user application you've seen using your technology and why? And let's try and keep these answers relatively short. We're sort of running out of time. I'm going to come to Philip first. And I didn't have time to prepare for that one. I only just thought of it. 
Um, let me think. Since we have such a wide array of use cases, um, I'm, I'm mostly thinking because we have something called the Elastia Awards, which is kind of for, for human causes. Um, and we've had a couple of great ones there from human trafficking to environmental um, overview of like how pollution is uh, working its way around in certain areas. So I think some of these more human related things are much more exciting than having some higher scale product or tuning a search a little bit. Um, so we have a couple of very interesting use cases around that to, to move us forward as people and not just from the te technical point of view. Thank you, thank you. How about you, Etienne? Yeah, there's, there's one that's super exciting, but I can't name names yet, but there is a good chance that someone is using VV8 without even noticing in something they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm very much looking forward to the point that we can make public what that is, which we can't do yet, but I'm extremely excited about that. And once we do, you'll understand why. Mysterious, but exciting. So, Joe. Yeah, I'll keep it court, uh, short, I mean. Um, Spotify is using Vespa, so I'm really proud of that experience because I think they have a great search, search experience. That is not only because of Vespa, but because they have a great search team, yeah. But I'm proud of them using Vespa. Great. Alessandro? So as a use case, I would say text retrieval. So I'm very proud of how Solar manages text retrieval and re-ranking as well, through learning to rank in terms of like uh, adoption. Uh, I've seen recently uh, healthcare sector using solar and in general like medical search engines that effectively map a, a, a doctor query for example to a diagnosis or uh, research papers related to a specific sickness uh, and I think it's great to see like this kind of usages of your search platform to effectively help people so that's also from a domain perspective, I'm very happy of that. Great, thank you. Did I ask you, Casper? Not yet. I didn't. So you're last for this yeah, one. Yeah, that's that's video. I'm not sure if I can also provide some names of our our customers that use Quadrant on a daily basis. But I can actually talk about a project that won the hackathon that we co-organized with Cohere, and people were asked to use a semantic search with at least uh, the embeddings provided by Cohere. By the winner project was like uh, automate, uh, automated tools for brand monitoring, um, brand awareness, and also for managing the, uh, some possible uh, issues. Uh, so it was actually monitoring all the social channels with uh, even for multiple languages and providing the answers using the uh, generative AI provided by Cohere. So that was like uh, all-in-one tool that could uh, handle uh, all, all the users that you may possibly have. This is actually still running. I hope this project will grow soon. Uh, and uh, I won't be sharing the name, but, but you can easily find it. So it's pretty exciting to see how it works. And the demo should be also published somewhere publicly. I think it's on YouTube. OK, thank you. So that's the end of our search engine debate. I, I'm not sure, did we make it clearer for you? which search engine to choose, but we certainly have found out a lot more about the, the engines represented here today. I'd like to thank all the panelists, um, Joe Christian Bergham, Alessandro Benedetti, Etienne de Locca, Kasper Lukowski, I always get that slightly wrong, <laughs> and Philip Kren. Please give them all a huge round of applause. <laughs>